Welcome to the OK Computer podcast takeover of the On The Tape feed. OK Computer is the latest offering for risk reversal media. We're going to cover all things tech, public and private markets, the intersection of Web 2 and Web 3. We have this amazing group of co-hosts and contributors. This is going to be in the On The Tape feed for a short period of time. So please follow OK Computer in your podcast stores so you get new episodes every Wednesday on your phone. Thanks. All right, welcome to OK Computer. I'm Dan Nathan. I'm here, as always, with Rick Heitzman, and we have a very special guest, somebody that OKC listeners have gotten familiar with over 2022 is Jeff Richards of GGB Capital. Gentlemen, welcome to OK Computer. Thanks, Dan. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, guys. We've wanted to have you on for a long time. Love your Twitter and excited to have you join us today. We do love your Twitter, Jeff. <laughs> Doesn't that come up on every single pod that we do with you? You are prolific, as they say, aren't you? It's funny. People always ask me, how much time do I spend on it? And I say, for me, it's really just like jumping in between Zooms. I jump on my phone, and it's a great place to get news. And then, of course, I love all the chatter, the FinTwit chatter, the sports chatter. I don't love the politics chatter, so I try to stay out of that. We're going to get to that. I'm actually going to get you to say something verbally, IRL, about some of that towards the end of this. But you and I chat a lot, Jeff. Obviously, Rick and I chat every day, and we do it on the pod once a week. But you guys are like East Coast, West Coast doppelgangers of each other in my mind. And I mean this seriously. So let me tell you why I think so. Because here you guys both are. I look to you. I look to your Twitter. I like to speak to you guys about what's going on in private tech markets. But you guys both have this really unique wealth of knowledge knowledge about public tech, a lot of experience with it. And I think your ability to extrapolate from the work that you're doing, the stuff that you're investing in, the people that you're talking to and extrapolate it to the public markets, I find really fascinating and really unique. And then the other thing is you both, when you're not talking tech, you're both very focused on the MBA, Jeff, you with your dubs and Rick with his sixers. But Rick has got a little confession to make right here. He's kind of adopted the Celtics it's not a full WWF heel turn of going to the Celtics, but obviously great friend of the pod, Wick Rouseback, is a Celtics owner, and therefore I've been spending more and more time with the Celtics over the time and was down in Miami to see the Celtics win Sunday night on their way to first of five straight victories that will end with four straight uh, in the finals. I think the Sixers are going to win next year, but at least for the next two weeks or so, I'm a Celtics fan. Jeff, what do you say to that? Because he really just called a sweep. Wick has been on the pod and he kind of predicted this, to be very frank. I don't think a lot of people saw the Celtics going to the finals, but a lot of people did not also consider the fact that the Warriors are going to be back. So what's your scouting report right here, Jeff? It's funny. A lot of us out here in the Bay Area knew the Warriors were good this year. We just had some health issues. Draymond got hurt. Clay was coming back after a two-year layoff. Steph got hurt. Fortunately, Steph and Draymond got hurt a month and a half before the playoffs, so they both got a little rest in because they're not young anymore. But I'll tell you, this team, when they're firing on all cylinders, they're tough to beat. I think it's going to be a fun series. I was psyched to see the Celtics win, and I think they'll match up well. But, man, try guarding Steph, Clay, Draymond when Wiggins is on his game. I mean, you got four legit all-star players on one team. They're tough to beat. And the Celtics match up well with them, right? They have the great defensive wingy guys, and then they added some more defensive presence with Dwayne White. So I think that it's going to be fun. I think the ball's going to move around fast, and they're going to be high-scoring games, which will be awesome. All right, East Coast, West Coast, you guys, like I said. We'll figure out the finals bet by the end of the pod. So, Jeff, you were very generous. Last week, you tweeted after our OK Computer episode, I had Ryan Dennehy, the CEO, founder of Electric, which you are an investor in his company. I know a friend of Ryan's and also Dan Turan, former operator at Managed by Q and now a VC like you all, uh, Gutter Capital. And we just wanted to have a conversation a little bit about some of the things that their experience as operators and how they're managing through what is probably the most difficult time that many new to private tech have seen in the last decade, but also from an investor standpoint, and Rick has spent a lot of time on the pod talking about some of his experience and the companies that he advises and he's invested in, and he's seen multiple cycles, as have you. And so we really want to hit all of that. But first and foremost, I don't think we would have been talking about that stuff in the private tech markets if we weren't talking about what was going on in public tech. And so it's really interesting to me as we're sitting here taping this Tuesday afternoon, holiday shortened week, we know that there was a huge rally in the markets over the last call week. 
week and a half or so. We have a NASDAQ that is down about 23%. It was down a little more than 30% at its lows, and the S&P 500 is only down 13%. Yet there are hundreds of stocks and just sector after sector that have just been cut in half with many of those stocks down 60, 70, 80% or so. Now, Jeff, you and I have talked about it. Rick, you and I have talked about it. And I'm just curious how you guys are thinking about when you see a rally like we had, to me, it really feels like we are in the throes of a protracted bear market. It's kind of dangerous to call a low too quickly or a bottom or however you want to do it. Jeff, I'm curious what you're thinking a little bit, because I know you're trying to be constructive. I know you're trying to take an intermediate to longer term view and try to find some very special values. Let me share a couple of thoughts. So one, the advice that we've given our portfolio companies is we don't know what the duration of this is going to be. And think about some of the issues that we're dealing with in terms of Russia, Ukraine, inflation that we haven't seen in 40 years, which clearly our elected officials weren't really ready for. If you look back to the commentary last summer and fall, most folks thought it was quote unquote transitory, it turned out not to be. And quite devastating. Out here in California, gas prices are up over $8. A friend of mine was on his boat this weekend in Tahoe. It was $9 a gallon for gas on the lake. So it's pretty challenging in terms of the issues we're facing. And they aren't things we've dealt with over the last few decades. So I tweeted out the other day, somebody said, well, entrepreneurs should have seen this coming. And I said, folks, the smartest economists and bankers and politicians in the world didn't see this coming. And yes, you could say, well, gosh, we printed $5 trillion. We pushed it out in the economy. What did you think was going to happen? Most founders aren't paying attention to that stuff. Most founders are waking up, they're grinding, they're hiring, they're trying to make the right decisions for their customers. They're not spending a lot of time on macro issues, nor should they. And so I just thought it was a little unrealistic to expect founder to be reading the tea leaves on the macro. Then secondly, you look at the investor community. Rick and I are, I'll say, more experienced than some of the folks that are newer to venture. Young, but experienced. Young, but experienced. I was in Silicon Valley. I moved to Silicon Valley in 1995. So I was here for the dot-com bubble. I was a founder at the time. It was brutal. And we had dot-com bubble and 9-11, the double whammy. Then we had the great financial crisis in 08, 09. So if you've lived through those two experiences, a couple things that you learn. One, you learn that while you're in the middle of the tornado, it's really hard to predict what's going to happen. I can give you a very optimistic projection for the rest of this year because there's an election. And I think that the government's going to do everything it possibly can to tell you that life is getting better over the next six months. But I can also give you some very scary predictions around rates going up and issues with China and our supply chain and labor and inflation. And so the advice we have to give our founders is we don't know how long this is going to take to play out. And so make sure you're well capitalized, do the right thing and get your business into a solid position from a fundamental standpoint. I'm on the board of another company. We just had a board meeting this morning. A year ago was burning $5 million a month and in April just burned 600 grand. Now the growth rate has slowed a bit. But they made a conscious decision six months ago based on some conversations we had in the board meeting in Q4 to say, hey, guys, we got to get this thing into a better position from a financial standpoint where we feel good about the underlying economics of the business. Then we can put capital in on top of that to grow with some new initiatives. So I think that's a lot of what you're seeing for folks that have the luxury of having a strong balance sheet. It's let's make sure the underlying fundamentals of the business are good, figure out where we want to invest on top of that. For folks that have to raise money in the next few months, it's challenging. It's a really challenging market, not only to get reasonable valuations, but just to get folks off their hands. Because a lot of the crossover investors in particular are looking at the market and saying, gosh, I can buy public companies like Twilio or Ring Central or even some of the high flyers like Snowflake is now trading, I believe, at 16 times forward. So they can buy things at what look like reasonable valuations given the growth rates and the fact that a lot of those public companies have been exceeding expectations. So just getting folks off their hands to invest right now is a little bit of a challenge. We're saying the same thing and continuing our NBA finals analogy of playing defense before you're playing offense and getting your financial house in order. If you have to right size your employee base, if you have to right size your burn, even if you have and you've already set up to be financing independent or create a fortress balance sheet, getting the fundamentals of your business in order so you can play offense. So you can play offense on the hiring side. You can play offense in acquiring customers when your competitors are weak or even on the M&A side, as I think that there's also going to be, and as part of all, all downturns, there's going to be growing consolidation. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned, Jeff, the company that went from a 5 million burn to less than a million, but the growth is slowing. And I think as we think about public markets, that comparison from the pull forward in demand during the pandemic and the deceleration that you saw was actually the thing before rates started going up, though, because a lot of those companies, Zoom, they topped out in late 2020. They topped out 
after the vaccines, before the Fed was really going to start to signal that they were worried about or change their tune about inflation and what they were going to have to do to battle it. And so I wonder now, though, if it's just the tip of the iceberg with private market valuations. Very soon, I think we've already seen, and Rick and I have been talking about this, and I know that you've been talking about it, Jeff, and there's nobody doing any dances about this because it's a very difficult situation when you start to see the job losses that are going to happen. That's the first way to kind of rationalize expenses. But it really feels like we're probably at the start of this valuation compression in private tech because there are so many companies that probably for whatever reason didn't cut the burn fast enough, didn't raise the sort of capital to make their way through a downturn. And now valuation is going to be compressed and investors are going to pull back to your point that they see things that are down 80% in public markets with a whole heck of a lot more transparency. Yeah. And I think the challenge you run into as a founder, one of the things we've been doing for some of our founders is putting together kind of a valuation matrix for them, not to tell them how much is your company worth, but to give them the same data that an investor looking at their business will have. What are the public comps? What are the reasons? So for example, we did one for a vertical software company the other day, and we were explaining to them why Viva trades at a much higher multiple of next year's revenue than Toast does. Toast is largely a payments business, not a pure software business. But if you're a founder, it's hard to distinguish between some of the different companies in these spaces. And what happens when the tide goes out, we're seeing this in fintech as well, people start to really analyze the underlying fundamentals of the business. What are gross margins look like? What does the growth rate look like? What is free cash flow? What is sales and marketing expense as a percentage of revenue? How efficient is this company in terms of growth? What is net dollar retention? Dan, you know, I love net dollar retention. It's one of my favorite metrics. And so people are really pulling back the covers and saying, hey, which of these businesses are the best businesses over the long run? And what you're seeing now is just this huge dispersion in terms of forward multiples where you've got Elastic Smart Sheet, which I love, I think is a terrific company, trading at five and a half times next year's revenue. Asana's trading at 6.9 times next year's revenue. So if you're a private company that's growing, even if you're in one of those same categories, call it the productivity space, and you're growing at 80 to 100% a year, which looks amazing, you can't go out and raise money at 25 times forward sales when the crossover investor you're meeting with can go invest in Smart Sheet at five and a half. And I think that's the disconnect we're seeing. And it's challenging as a founder because you're being asked to shift your mentality on a dime. My advice to those folks is if you're well capitalized, make sure your business is well run. But again, focus on the long run. You can't run your business quarter to quarter. It's just one of the tyrannies of the public market. And you always love it when companies come out and say, we beat our earnings by a penny. And they do it every quarter for 20 years, whatever Microsoft did. Yeah, Cisco. <laughs> Cisco. I think Cisco was like 103 quarters in a row where they beat by a penny. We're going to have David Gellis on the podcast, New York Times journalist, and he just wrote a book, The Man Who Broke Capitalism, is about Jack Wells. And it really is talking about for 20 years, they beat by a penny and Wall Street loved them because the consistency, they didn't care how they got to it. But it's really interesting that you mentioned Twilio twice now, Jeff, and you talk about that multiple of the sales, which has come down so much. Here is as a public market investor, though, that I'm really focused on is that this company on a gap basis lost close to a billion dollars last year. There's supposed to do the same this year. So I guess my question to you, Rick, your companies, you're not solving to profitability. You're solving right now to kind of less losses, right? At a time where capital is more constrained or harder to come by or just given the rate environment. Well, we're solving to optionality. What you're seeing with Jeff's company's example, where you took down burn, even though you might have decreased your growth rate, you're creating a lot more options. No one's sure where this is going to go. No different than a year ago, the greatest economists in the world could not have predicted what's going to happen. So the reasonable case is no one knows what's going to happen in a year. No one knows what the Fed's going to do. No one knows what's going to happen in the midterm elections. So what you want to do is have the optionality a year from now that you could either press the gas or press the brakes. And by having a tank full of gas, that gives you more optionality. Eliminating financing risk and having a fortress balance sheet enables you to do it. And because I think in the direction you're going, no one's sure what the revenue and earning side of their business is going to be given the future economic environment. The thing you can control is expenses. So controlling those expenses, keeping plenty of cash on your balance sheet so you can be offensive, whether that's growing your sales channel or doing M&A, is the only thing you could do to maximize your optionality. The other thing I'll just add, Dan, is... 
I agree with everything Rick just said. I was a two-time founder, spent more time as a founder than I have as a venture capitalist. The only advice that I've given to some earlier stage founders who are getting advice, even in spite of the market, to go, 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 raise capital, go, go, go. If you have a strong balance sheet, go, go, go. The only caveat that I've shared with a few founders is, look, there's a difference between the pig and the chicken on the farm. You guys know that story? The pig and the chicken? Oh, yeah. Tell it again, though. It's a classic. Chicken says to the pig, let's start a restaurant. And the pig says, well, that sounds great. He says, we're going to serve, we'll serve breakfast. It's going to be great. And you and I will be a big part of it. We'll be co-owners. The pig thinks about it. He says, you know, there's a little bit of a problem with this because you lay eggs, but then you're still around. But when we need ham and bacon for the breakfast, I'm all in. I'm gone. That's the end for, for me. And so what I've tried to convey to a few founders is in many cases, your investors are the chicken and you are the pig. And so you have to think a little bit differently as a founder I want to have a company that's around in two years. If the market is severe and I can't raise capital, I want to make sure I have a company that is still around. So you have to balance that optimism. And by the way, one of the big challenges we have right now, we're not seeing any slowdown in demand. Most of the time when we're having these kinds of conversations, we have seen a slowdown in demand. Unemployment is rising. Budgets are being cut. Contracts are taking longer to get done. We haven't seen that. I don't know about you, Rick, but our companies had great Q1s. A lot of them beat their numbers. And you're seeing that in the public market as well. So it's very hard psychologically as a founder to get your head around. I need to be cautious, even though all the buying signals in the market are very positive. I think we are starting to get concerned about what does it mean, especially in the SaaS world, we were paying on seats and net dollar retention and net revenue retention is such a huge metric that we were also living in a world where everyone was growing their employee base. So as those employee bases were growing year over year, definitionally on a seats basis, you're getting more revenue. Now in a time where there's a hiring freeze or layoffs, what does that mean? And this is before the CFO comes in and makes everyone justify the ROI on software, which we've seen in every other recession. So I think in a prolonged negative economic cycle and even a recession, you haven't seen it yet. You haven't seen it looking backwards, but there's definitely scenarios where we could see there's pressure on the revenue line. That's a really important point because go back, Jeff, to your time in Silicon Valley as an operator in the late 90s in the buildup. And what were all these companies doing? They were buying Sun Microsystems servers. They were using Exodus communication. And then all of a sudden, Yahoo placed one too many banner ads in early 2000 on a website and the whole thing came crashing down. Now, obviously, there's a lot more that happened to that, but then the demand did shift. And I think that you made a really interesting point about your founders just really not focused to the macro because it's really hard for so many sophisticated public macro investors to get that right or economists or strategists or however you want to think about it. All that being said, right now, we are being driven by macro forces. You wake up today, there are two headlines. So what's going on with the EU and oil, and we have oil trading at two-month highs here, and you just talked about the effect that that's having on consumers or will have on a protracted basis. But then this other headline out of Foxconn, which is largest manufacturer of iPhones, which was saying that hey, you know what? Maybe these last few months weren't as bad as we thought. And so when you put those two headlines together, you say, all right, so if we're going to have this supply demand thing come better into balance, and maybe we're at peak sort of energy because that's the headline that you were waiting for, that sort of thing, then maybe everything moderates and maybe we get out of this thing okay because then the Fed can stop raising interest rates, right? Like that would be the soft landing sort of scenario. And again, I go back to the fact that if that's the case and the worst thing that happened was the NASDAQ sold off 30% and the S&P sold off 20% and private valuations did not get absolutely destroyed, then we're okay, right? That's the bull case. The multiples go back to pre-pandemic levels, which were fairly healthy, high single digits for most companies. Premium companies were at a premium, which is kind of where we are now. And earnings and growth continue because hopefully a lot of these companies are doing things which create value for folks. That's the bull case. And I think that's probably as good as we'll be able to do if the Fed's able to keep their hands off all the knobs and dials. The components that scare me the most or concern me most at a macro level, Dan, are the supply chain challenges because I don't feel like we've done a whole lot to fix them. Look at the baby formula issue, which Biden says he wasn't even briefed on until a month ago. It just doesn't feel like we have a great handle on a lot of the basic components, semiconductors, ports. These issues feel like things that aren't going to be easy to fix. 
The second one is labor. I believe that in 10 years, we're going to look back at this COVID window and realize that our whole economy changed. I was talking to a friend of mine last weekend whose wife is an assistant golf pro. She had a baby. Six months later, she was planning to go back to work. This is a few months ago. She can't go back. She can't get anybody to take care of her baby. There's no child care. There's no restaurant workers or no hotel workers. And the implications of that are so significant. I think we're still just starting to digest them. I had a friend of mine who went down to Southern California for spring break. And he said he was talking to the guy who runs the hotel. And he said, why are your rates double what they were a year ago? He said, well, I've got half as much labor. And he says, okay. He says, so all I did is I just closed half the rooms. So I run a hotel that's half as big and I doubled the rates. And he said, I don't have any choice. I can't get the labor to run at full capacity. So I can't run at full capacity and I can't run it at my old pricing with half capacity. So my guess is that hotel's also probably full. It's full. Exactly. He's economically indifferent and the problems could become exacerbated. Talk to restaurants in New York City. I'm not sure if you were walking around, Dan, yesterday, but beautiful spring day. Every single seat was full at every single restaurant that was open. And I think you had 20% of restaurants closed because it was a Sunday holiday. And everyone was afraid to ask their workers to come in on this holiday weekend. Yeah, this is where I go back to the transitory, though, guys. And again, I think that this is what the Fed is trying to solve for in a way, because we've had this weird supply demand dynamic. We had for a year, millions and millions of Americans who were given cash, told to stay at home, weren't purchasing on the sorts of things that they normally would, not conducting their lives the way they are. We're still not back to the office. So I just think that a lot of this is going to correct itself. We also have this really huge push towards deglobalization, which I think right now, Jeff, to your point about supply chains, that's a big part of this whole equation. But at the end of the day, if we do have something that doesn't look like the COVID boom and then the post COVID boom, and we go back to some mean reverting sort of thing, I think we get back to that place where people need jobs again because Web3 didn't solve it or whatever. And I'm being snarky there. Or just gasoline's too expensive. We tried to survive as a single income household, but where gas prices are and commodities are, we have to go back to the way it was in 2019. And I'll be honest with you, I am positive. The unemployment is low. The data that I'm seeing from our companies that cater to small businesses are very strong in terms of the post-pandemic bounce back, services-oriented businesses getting back into the flow. Obviously, they still have their labor challenges, but we saw a dip in capacity to work in December and January with the Omicron variant. We're now moving out of that. So we're seeing a lot of positive underlying signals. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the headlines have a funny way of turning positive when there's an election. And I think over the next six months, you're going to see a lot of very positive narratives around how things are changing. Plus, if you just think about the inflation comps, the year over year comps, the percentages are going to come down. Can't keep raising used car prices forever. And so those numbers are going to magically look better than they did 90 days ago. I made a bet with one of my partners that the NASDAQ will be up 15 to 20 percent from the lows by the end of the year. Dan, where are you as resident bear? Are you taking the other side of that? And I'm probably wrong. <laughs> it's not even that I'm the resident bear. I've been talking about it on this podcast. I'll tell you things that I bought in the last few months. And this is right out of the Jeff Richards playbook here, to be very frank. I started buying the QQQ. I had not been doing that in a long time. One of my views there is that the five or six stocks that make up 40, 45% of the weight will lead us. They will be tech leaders. Again, they're all that one to $2 trillion club. And they have not been hurt hard enough, in my opinion. You have Microsoft down 20% of the year, Apple down 16.5%, Google down about 22%. Amazon has obviously been the hardest hit, down 30%. I think Tesla goes much lower. We'll talk about Tesla a bit later in the pod. But then you get dozens of stocks that are down 50, 60, 70 80%. Now, some of them may never really come back, but those stocks, if the lesson from early 2000s or the post-financial crisis, those stocks can be up 200% in a heartbeat and really kind of help those sorts of things. So I'm doing that in the queues. Snap, I believe in five years, Snap will once again be a $75 billion market cap company. Okay. It's got a $20 billion enterprise value right now. So you think that's a venture bet, 3X in three years? Yeah, I really do. Because what I'm trying to do is find a few situations that do look like venture. I'm not you. I'm not fancy venture capitalists. Okay. And then another one is that I hated this stock when it had a larger market cap than Bank of America in early 2021, it was PayPal. Well, now it's under $100 billion, and I like the business. I'm picking at stuff like that with you know a multi-year view. If I still had my trading cap on from 20 years ago, this is a great market. I mean, this is a fabulous market to be banging around like that. 100% agree. I tweeted out on May 26th, you could go back in time, would you have bought Salesforce 
stock in June of 2009 at $10 a share. Revenue was $1.24 billion that year and grew 24%. Market cap was $10 billion, up from $4 billion in 2008, by the way. I didn't pick the low. It hasn't grown more than 36% in any year since then, and it's up 16x. We are going to have some 10 to 16x returns in some of these cloud software names in particular. I would argue fintech maybe as well over the next five to 10 years. I 100% believe that. I mean, you just look at the growth rates and the market opportunity. Another company that you guys have seen me tweet about probably is Delo, a Latin American fintech business, just reported an unbelievable quarter where 127% year over year growth on total payment volume, 117% year over year growth in revenue. And this company has, or I'd have to look, I think it has around an eight, eight and a half billion dollar market cap. Could you see that company being a 10X from here and being a 50 to $100 billion company in five to 10 years? I think you can. Now, they have to execute. And of course, when I posted my CRM tweet, people said, well, yeah, but if you chose this dog shit company, it went nowhere. I'm like, yeah, welcome to investing. Like you have to pick the right companies, but there are going to be some 10, 15, 20X returns from here. It's a great time to be picking if you have that long time horizon. Even in 99, the class of 99, which is if comparing analogies might look a little bit like the class of 2021, if you would have invested in all of those public financings, you would have had a mid-teens type return. So again, market top to market bottom, and there's going to be winners. And in that case, it was Checkpoint Software, but most importantly, eBay, who became monsters. One of our analogies we use here is babies out with the bathwater. There were some babies last year, or there were some emergent titans who've gotten unduly punished that we think have tremendous upside. Yeah. And I'll just throw one more out there. And Rick, you and I talked about a few weeks ago when it was very near its lows, but Shopify, here's a company with under a $50 billion market cap. And we could dig into some of the trends there, but will this thing be a $200 billion market cap again? Yeah, it will be. Do people like buying things online? Yeah, but I don't think it's going to take 10 years to even do that. So one question to both of you before we pivot to our conversation last week with Ryan and Dan for a second, are your spidey senses coming up where you're starting to see better opportunities in public markets? And I'm not trying to throw any shade on the processes that you have in private markets or anything like that, but just because of the lag between the multiple compression in private to public, because we've already seen it in some of the higher growth, the sort of things that might attract you, right? So I'm just curious if that's something that you're starting to feel right now. We're starting to see it. We're starting to feel it. We're starting to make some investments. There is a gap. It's unlike the liquid public markets where there has to be a market clearing price every day. There's still some founders who haven't gotten the religion on this, and that creates a gap. There's also a weird dynamic. And again, there's not a market clearing price every day that folks said, hey, this is a really tough market. I just raised a ton of money in 2020 or 2021. I'm going to sit out either the first half or all of 2022 until the market renormalizes. So there's companies that we'd love to invest in at 2022 prices. We got priced out in 2020 or 2021 that we're hoping that the market comes back to us or hope that they need a market clearing price or are willing to buy a little bit more insurance of a couple more quarters. Yeah, I think, Dan, your question was, as an investor, am I excited about what we see in the public markets? And Obviously, as a venture capital firm, our mandate is to invest in private companies. You know, I've been investing in public equity since I was 12. I've never been shy about saying my dad let me buy Microsoft right after it went public and it doubled and I sold it. (laughs) I've cried about it ever since. So I've been following the public markets for 30 years plus. And there are some great public companies that are in the, call it 100 to 200 million, 300 million of annual revenue that look like private companies that are getting funded in the 5 to $10 billion range. And so you as a personal investor can go buy those, right? I'll give you a couple names. One we haven't mentioned so far is Braze, B-R-Z-E. Really cool enterprise software company based in New York. I'm sure you know it well, Rick. Of course. Yeah, those guys are great. Yeah, kind of sitting in the middle of CRM and mobile. And this is a company that'll do, call it a 250, 300 million run rate business. It's valued at $3 billion. And you sort of ask yourself, do I think that company continues to grow in that market as mobile continue to be important for brands and e-commerce, et cetera, really good management team. I can go to Rick's point in the public market. I've got liquidity every day. I can buy and sell those equities every day in the private market. One of the reasons why we don't see valuations reset very quickly is there is no market. So it's really until the founder decides he or she wants to raise additional capital, does a new price get set? As an individual investor, man, you have a really unique opportunity to take advantage of this window, I think, as long as you have a long time horizon, because to all the comments we made earlier, there could still be some more pain to come in terms of rates and inflation and labor challenges. And so even as you're buying, and I've been nibbling on a few things that I like, 
I'm saying to myself, gosh, if it goes down another 10, 20%, I'll just be ready to buy more. But I can't get too emotionally wrapped around the fact that I might not be hitting the bottom. I think that's a really important message because I think that's kind of where we are in this market cycle here. Just because there was so much damage being done in large parts of, let's say, the tech market for the last year and a half or so, the major indices really didn't start to catch up. And so that very lag might be the thing that causes a protracted bear market. Rates stay high. We've seen what happened to the 30-year mortgage. It's nearly doubled. If housing starts to come in, you have this negative wealth effect from risk assets people have. You get a bit of a buyer strike. This is all the stuff that, again, this is not easy stuff for a lot of investors who have not been through different cycles, but that's the sort of psyche. If you're buying a stock that's down 60, 70, 80% right now, and you're listening to everything that we just said, because we think in five years, it could be five, 10 X or whatever, understand that it could still get cut in half again. And that was the lesson that we learned in the post.com crisis in the global financial crisis. So you never go all in. You're always going to regret that you didn't buy more. No one rings a bell at the bottom. And just as we've talked about, you're part of the bringing the private market mentality to the public markets is you're hoping to play the longest game in the room. You're hoping to say, hey, these are businesses I'll be happy to hold, not for a week, a month, a quarter, even a year, but these are businesses I'm excited to hold in the long term. Yeah, but it also comes down to management of your own investable capital. If you're extending yourself, you're doing it on margin, whatever the equivalent is of doing it on an institutional basis, those are the things that cause liquidations. And so those are the things you want to avoid. No matter how good you feel about an individual story, you have to have a little restraint. You have to have respect for the macro environment around you and that you have no control over it. All right, really quickly, Jeff, I'd love to get because I know you and I connected after I met Ryan Dennehy a couple of years ago. I actually met him with Dan Charan. I remember you and I DMing about it and you telling me you think he was a brilliant founder. And I'm just curious, how does it feel? You see one of these guys, it sounds like you've been a bit of a mentor. You hear him on a podcast. You're like, that guy's smart. What were some of your takeaways from that conversation? Well, both. And I know Dan, because I met Dan when he was raising money for Managed by Q as well. And I did give him the feedback along the way that I thought it was going to be a really hard business to scale. And he said that on the podcast. They're both great because they're both very thoughtful and very reflective people. They're both people who are very self-aware. One of the things we look for in founders is, are you self-aware? Can you take feedback and input and read the room a bit? And both of those, I just thought it was a very thoughtful and reflective podcast where both of them said, look, we both have made a lot of mistakes along the way as founders. And I always try to tell people, none of us know what we're doing. We're all making it up. I'm a parent of four kids. Trust me, I've never had four kids before. I'm making it up every single day. And a lot of that is true of investing and operating as well. You're learning, you're getting better at what you do. There's a reason that people like Frank Slootman are amazing at what they do because he's been doing it for 40 years and he's made a lot of mistakes and he learned a lot along the way. He wasn't nearly as good at when he was 30 as he is when he was 60. So what I really enjoyed about it was just the two of them sharing some lessons learned, sharing some of the scars that they've built up over the years. I try and get other founders, particularly first-time founders, to listen to those as much as I can because it's comforting, one, to hear people say, hey, I made a lot of mistakes, and two, to hear them point out the things that they've learned. Dan made a comment. He said, you can't be the only green one in the room. And I loved that comment because it's something that we're constantly spending time with founders on. Look, you can't have everybody in the room figuring it out for the first time. you got to find a way to get leadership around the table with people who have experience. So I just thought it was a very thoughtful, very calming, and very introspective look, Dan, without a lot of hype and a lot of chest beating, you know, despite both guys being very successful. That being said, you should have been our Uber on the way home because there was some chest beating going on. No, it got a little hot. No, but you know, Rick and I have been talking about this sort of stuff every week. So it's amazing to have other people with other perspectives come on. And again, I think Dan for in his early thirties is one of the most thoughtful guys that I've come across as an operator, as an investor. And I really enjoyed talking to him and it was great listening to Ryan a little bit. All right, guys. Well, we teased it before here. I think you both know individually that I'm a bit exercised by what I think this weird turn that Elon Musk has taken as it relates to his acquisition of Twitter, why he supposedly wants to do it in the name of free speech and all the behavior. I think he's literally self-emulating literally on Twitter every day. That being said, I've been pulling all of my tech friends. I'm not going to ask you to opine on his behavior one way or another, but at some point, if it went a little too far, don't you think he runs the risk of alienating Tesla owners or future Tesla buyers? Because a lot of the people that he's kind of speaking to on Twitter, they're not Tesla buyers. 
They don't actually even believe in climate change. You know what I'm saying? So it's just kind of a weird thing. So I'm just curious real quickly, your guys take, you both own Teslas. You obviously like them. Is there a bridge too far for Elon Musk? I honestly try to stay out of politics, Twitter. It just drives me nuts. And I think it's the advent of social media as a place for political discourse has fragmented our country in a way that I don't like. It's the reason I got off Facebook years ago. I stopped using Facebook because I saw people posting all this crazy stuff. So I don't love that dynamic and I don't love that trend. And I guess my hope would be that when this whole saga with him trying to acquire Twitter is over, maybe he'll go back to being the Elon that is CEO of SpaceX and Tesla, because I just don't love all of us veering off into snarky politics on social media. Yeah, I think there is a bridge too far. I think that when you buy a product, you are effectively voting with the ethos of that company. And I haven't gone as deep, similar to Jeff. I avoid politics on social media for all the normal reasons. So I haven't dug deep on it, but clearly there's a bridge too far and he might be getting close to that. All right. Well, I'm going to say, listen, gentlemen, for five years since Trump went down that golden escalator and I had to sit there on fast money as CNBC was covering it. And then for five years, almost every day, the way that they amplified all of the messaging there, I said my piece almost every day and I have no regrets about it. I do believe this is a little bit of a prediction here. I think there's going to come a time in the not so distant future where you're going to start seeing people turn in their Tesla keys. All right, listen, guys, we covered a lot of ground. I really appreciate hearing from you guys the sorts of conversations that you're having with the companies that you advise. It helps inform the way I think about macro, the way I think about public tech markets. So, Jeff, thank you very much for coming back. I think you come back for the Comos. <laughs> I know you have your own, but I think you do. And we're going to keep switching it up. You're going to get new and beautiful bottles of Comos. And we have to check on the NASDAQ plus 15% bet. I was going to say, I'll come back after the Warriors win in six and Rick and I can figure out what we're going to settle on. Yeah, we'll figure out what that bet is as well. I think it's a bottle of tequila. All right, guys, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. All right, when we come back, I sit down with Heather Harden, a general partner at Human Ventures. Heather Hartnett is CEO and general partner at Human Ventures in New York City. Heather started the early stage venture fund and startup studio in 2015. Since launching, Human Ventures has invested in and co-built more than 65 companies, including Current, The Skim, Tiny Organics, and Tia Health. Prior to founding Human, Heather worked at a variety of other venture firms, including Lightspeed Venture Partners, City Light Capital, and Claremont Creek Ventures. All right. Welcome back to OK Computer. I have a very special guest, a a woman that I would call a mentor of mine in this business. Her name is Heather Hartnett. She is the CEO and general partner of Human Ventures. Heather, welcome to OK Computer. Thank you for having me. That's kind of you to say. I was going to say, it's really fun to have mentors who are much younger than you, but you're much more experienced at building. And I really have appreciated your guidance over the last few years since we first met. How did we meet again? Who who did we meet? Joe Marchese. Joe Marchese loves uh, OK computer. He is one, probably one of the first people to listen to each episode when they drop on Wednesday mornings. He does it when he's working out early in the morning. I think he loves to tabulate how many name drops he gets. You know what I mean? He's got an awful, you've got an awful lot also, but this is your first appearance. So thank you for being here. So we met through Joe. I think it was summer of 2019. I was laying out the framework for how Guy and I wanted to do financial media. We had been doing it on TV for a long time. We had been active on social with doing it, but we had some other ideas about building a long form platform and incubating a bunch of other talent in and around us. And so you were really helpful in my thought process of all that. So thank you. I wouldn't be here without you, Heather. You're welcome. I mean, the pleasure is mine. I mean, you're absolutely an example of our thesis at Human Ventures, where founders don't necessarily always look the same as the Silicon Valley, the 22-year-old hoodies who are building tech platforms, but really the industry experts who know what they're doing. And now you're entrepreneurial. I've gotten to meet tons of the companies that you've incubated or that you've invested in over the last few years. And it really doesn't fit a certain mold as far as the way people think about tech investors. And so talk to me a little bit about human. I've heard it from you and from Joe. I've had the pleasure of partaking in a lot of your events that you host with your LPs, with your portfolio companies. And human's a little different than most VC funds. And being here in New York City, I think that's also something that really differentiates you. Talk 
talk to me a little bit about Human and how it came to be and really what the name means to you guys. Yeah, definitely. So Human Ventures, at its core, we're a next-generation venture capital firm, and we invest we say build all the way to Series A. And it is different because I think in this day and age when there are a lot of venture capital funds, you have to really be clear about your value prop. You have to be very clear about how you're differentiated. We started in 2015 actually as what's called a startup studio. And we saw a need. So Joe is a serial entrepreneur. He's been in the media space for a long time. He sold his last business to Fox. And when he did, he came to me and he said, okay, it's go time. If we want to start this startup studio, let's do it together now and, and I'll be your first backer. And so really it was the first example of what we were talking about. You find people who have been in kind of a different part of the industry. You're investing in them. You're also giving them operational support, kind of a lens like we did with you. Say, this is how you can start from zero to one. You're very successful in your industry. You know what you know. So let's be able to help you build and then also give you a network of incredible builders alongside you. So in New York, especially at that time, there really weren't many places for builders to build together. So that was the premise. And the human element, Joe and I really value these networks of good people. And we've known each other for over 15 years, probably. And when we introduced each other to people, we said, this is a good human. And we knew what that meant. It wasn't just great and excellent at what they did in life, but also they were good to their core and they were going to come back around. It's something that you guys live. And again, I've gotten to know your network. And I think that you like to surround yourselves with good humans. Let's take a step back, though, because before you started this studio, and then obviously that turned into a venture firm. Also, you worked in venture. What drove you to venture? How did you find yourself as a VC in New York City? Well, I started from a long line of entrepreneurs. So I was lucky enough to have my grandfather was an entrepreneur. My dad was an entrepreneur in the telecom boom and bust. Yeah. I learned a lot through then. It was kind of vulture capital back then. There was never venture capital. But when I graduated school, 2005, dates me, he said, not what job are you going to get, but what value are you going to create? So what are you going to create? And so I went out to the Bay Area. I said, this is where entrepreneurs are. I want to see what everybody's building. And I was lucky enough to have a family friend out there who did this thing called venture. And I just, everything I could to meet with the founders and listen. Wasn't a sexy job back then. No, God, 2005, no. you're still in web one and a half-ish. Yeah. It's not web two just yet because we don't really have social at that point. But we have some of the platforms that made it through web one in a way. We're starting to flex a little bit, right? But venture was not a big industry back then. No, and to give you context, I'm the same year as Mark Zuckerberg. So what, he was in Palo Alto when I was there in the Bay Area, you know. Did you party at that house from the movie? I didn't. I wasn't cool enough. I wasn't not cool enough, maybe. I just not say. cool enough, I think. But no, I was lucky. The venture firm that I was shadowing at and researching and doing everything I could to be there, they were ex-founders. I was looking at how the unbanked were going to be banked in Africa and people who had cell phones but didn't have bank accounts. What was And that was back then. Yeah. Anyway, so fast forward, I actually came to New York in more of the philanthropic and the impact investing lens and worked with family offices here. And then there was something that was happening where a lot of the really good founders in New York, they had this mission-driven bent and there were these social entrepreneurs. There was Neil and Dave from Warby Parker and they had a social bent. There was Tom's was starting and Joe Marchese was one of those social entrepreneurs. Scott Harrison who started Charity Water. It was like either you started a nonprofit that had a tech backbone or you're starting these companies that had a social angle. And that's what really began our network of really incredible founders here in New York. Well, it's interesting because when you think about right now how fintech and Web3 and crypto in general, it really is firmly entrenched in the New York City tech culture, if you will. And going back to that period, I guess, in the late aughts or early 2010s, you had Silicon Valley and you had Andreessen just blowing up and blowing up in a good way. And then you had Wall Street here and you had a lot of stuff like associated with that. But it's really interesting interesting that there was always this East Coast, West Coast thing, but you firmly said, I want to do it here. Was it something about the culture here in New York City, just the kind of scrappiness? I think it was the people, the diversity. We were wanting to build products for people. Where are the people? If they're New York. A lot more diversity in all sense of the words, but really around the industries too. And you kind of saw in the early aughts, there was the engineer was king. And then it started to become a little bit more ubiquitous. The tech was everywhere. And it was actually not just an industry itself, but it was underlying all the different industries. Where is the hub? Where are the customers? Where is the fund? Like there's so much money in New York. And so when people started to understand that growth capital and understand investing in innovation, there was this really magical spark that happened with New York. And now it's the fastest growing ecosystem in tech. 
Yeah, well, let's talk about that. I know this from my personal experience. I think you guys are really good at identifying trends in the market. And so you just said that the financialization of everything, if you're in New York City, it's not surprising that this fintech hub so close to Wall Street, if you will. So talk to me a little bit about some of the trends that you guys have just locked into since starting the studio, since launching Fund One in 2019. Are there some common threads throughout? Yeah, definitely. So as our name says, human, it's all about the founders. We're early stage investors and builders. And so it's all about the people that you're investing and building with. Venture for me in early stage and being around entrepreneurs and having grown up around entrepreneurship, it's really about two things. One, seeing the trends. What's 10 years out? Who can see 10 years out? Really founders, only founders. And then who are the types of people who are going to usher in those trends? And then who are the people who you think you want to back? Because look, I don't say that I'm 10 years out. I have to identify the people who see 10 years down the line. And Joe is one of those types of people in media. As long as I've known him, he said the same thing about media. And it's taken 10 different forms, and he's been able to identify that. But it's really inspiring to find people who can really actually live 10 years out. Hard to not talk about where the market is right now. People are near-term thinkers, but founders are these long-term thinkers. And that's what is compelling to chase. But also, you want to see the world before all of the capital sees it and back those founders until the world sees what you see. Yeah. How is that, though, heading into 2020? Things were predominantly optimistic. We have this black swan event, which is the pandemic. Everyone's business decentralized. Everyone's lives decentralized, whether it be school or you know work or whatever. How did you guys deploy capital during that period? You're also running a business. You're a CEO of, of Human Ventures. You have lots of livelihoods that are on the hook for you. I'm just curious, lessons of being first-time CEO during a period like that. Well, let me step back a little bit. First of all, our thesis around the human needs economy, that was pre-pandemic. But we said, yes, there's going to be all these technology innovations, but actually the technologies outpace the human condition. There's going to be things like healthcare that's needed and education and how are you understanding relationships and how are you matching to talent and finding your career, your livelihood, environment, all these things. My background in impact and impact investing had that lens, but I knew that the people who were thinking 10 years out were thinking about this as business opportunities. Joe, coming from advertising and understanding that advertising is actually going the subprime advertising market and how the algorithms are actually just trying to get your impressions, not your actual attention, not your engagement – We said, how are we actually finding quality products and services, creating quality products and services? And those are going to be the brands long term that are going to be lasting. So you ask how we fared the pandemic. I mean, it was all triage for every single one of our companies. But we really approached it in a human way because we were Build Studio. We had about 40 employees at that time. And every morning we had a 15 minute stand up where we got everybody together with their camera on. We didn't talk about work. We rotated. Everybody led the meetings. We rotated. You couldn't talk about work. So I found out about the jazz musician that was on our team and the guy who knows how to do the professional cooking and all this sort of stuff. All these things that actually we didn't know about our team that came out. But what it did was show us also, this is what every company was going through. Whether you cared or not, you were going to be a human-based company or you weren't going to make it. So that solidified our thesis even more, that the next generation founders really understood that. So areas like health and wellness, like you said, pre-pandemic, these were focuses of yours. And were some of the criticisms of those spaces, like, how do you make money in those things? Was that part of the thing is like, how do you make money in altruistic businesses? Yeah. And the the fact is that their actual needs. I mean, just an example, you know, when we started and we invested in a company called Tia Women's Healthcare, they started as a chat bot for, you know, questions for teenage women. They overwhelmingly saw this response of actually women just didn't have a place to go for primary care. Women, 51 percent of the population. So they called it niche. We said niche no more. Now even just one area, fertility, will be $26 billion in five years. It's expected. I mean, it's a massive underinvested market. So now those things that seemed altruistic, actually, they were underinvested in, and they're poised to be the biggest financial returners. Right. And when you think about how early you are identifying some of these trends, identifying the founders who are actually looking at things that are maybe not so obvious to everybody else, I think it's interesting. The story of the pandemic, at least in the public markets, was, yeah, we had a crash in the beginning of 2020 once it became very clear that this was something that people were not going to be able to identify what the worst case scenarios were, how long it was going to last, what the financial outcomes were going to be. But then when we had this period, we're like, okay, technology is going to help us get through this, right? And so we saw public market valuations just go ballistic. And what's the story of 2021, though, 
and you know this really clearly, and 2022 now, as we're five months or so into this, is that those valuations are being reset. So I'm curious, how quick were private markets identifying some of these trends that are early and they're going to take a long time to play out? Did you find yourselves going from, my goodness, we might sit on our hands and not deploy any capital for a while because we're in the middle of a black hole as it relates to the pandemic, to, oh my goodness, we got to go get involved in this deal because things are going to be accelerated really quickly. You might not believe this, but we have been absolutely consistent and true to our investing strategy throughout 2020, 2021, and into 2022. There has not been a change. We're fairly insulated. So you cannot listen to the public markets when you're an early stage investor. It's going to be a very different public market environment when our companies go to exit in seven to 10 years. And so this is the best time to be with founders who are building. When all of these public companies are kind of underwater, talent is flocking to where there might be new opportunity. Also in New York, we're kind of in second, third generation of these companies. And the early employees are leaving. They have more understanding of the business models. They have more discipline. And so right now is the time to invest. We were just talking about this coming out of 2008. That was the financial recession. And it exposed cracks in the financial system. The sharing economy started. That's when you really start to create value and all the fair weather founders get knocked out. So compare that to right now. We have a human recession, 2020. All the value is coming out of that. It's going to be created right now in the early stages. So I try to put my blinders on to the profits of the market. Oh, I think that's smart. Guy Adami, my partner and I, we just had this conversation on one of our podcasts the other day. It's like we were brought up in the markets 25 years ago for me and maybe close to 35 years ago for him. And we were traders and we were staring at Bloomberg or fax up machines and we're watching every tick of something and we're reacting quickly. and We're trying to game out how something's going to play out over a short period of time. And now we find ourselves, you know, 25 years later for me, I look at markets through like a trader's lens. That's how I was trained. Now I have to think about things differently because who I'm speaking to are not doing that. And this is my message to most investors as it relates to public markets is like, you have to look by the next hump. You can't be thinking about the here and now always. And so to me, I I think that makes total, total sense. So if we're talking about time horizons, though, and you're in a rocky period, like we were a couple years ago, you said you've been very consistent about how you're deploying capital. How do things like valuations, so we see that there's a lag, right, between, and if you go look back in the last 30 years or so from the public markets to the private markets, you see maybe like a six-month lag, a nine-month lag or something like that. How does that affect some of your thinking about how you're deploying capital, though? Because a lot of people in public markets, they're waiting for things to get cheaper, they get cheaper. You wait long enough, you're going to miss it. So I'm just curious how you guys think about that a little bit because we're starting to see that knock-on effect right now. We're starting to see private valuations come in. Now, is that good or bad if you're a VC? I think it depends whether or not your rubrics for evaluating those companies were disciplined or not. And so I think that the people who are using their lens to value their companies in the right way, they won't see as much of a knock on that. Now, I do think in the later stages, that's where you're seeing a lot of that happening, right? In the earlier stages, we are sometimes the very first money in, and we're not even pricing the companies at that point. Right. And you're really strict about what metrics show that you actually have a product market fit. And then being able to put on the gas, your go-to-market strategy when you actually know that you have a product that people want. So that early discipline is really important to understand. I mean, I think for subsequent rounds of funding, it's important. But software is not going anywhere. There was a lot of capital that was raised in 2021 from the funds. So there's a lot of capital out there. But I think it's a race to good quality. There'll still be quality investments that are made for sure. It's just not going to be a lot of hype. Yeah. What do you make of this? And I've heard you use this term before, the Hollywoodization of tech founders and stuff. Because one of the things that's different about this cycle right now is that if you go back and look at, let's say, in the post-financial crisis, there was a lot of great companies that were founded, but these people didn't have the platforms. Maybe they had a blog back then or something like that. So they didn't have the ability to build a persona around their thought process, and they didn't have the ability to create this fanboy culture or whatever. Now, Twitter has changed the game on that. And there are very few other platforms that do it the way Twitter does. So there's a lot of just seeking a certain amount of attention. I'm just curious how you think about that, because I also know a lot of founders who they have an exit and then they're like, yeah, the funds that back me, they're like willing to give me a $50 million check for whatever I want to do next. And so part of that is building a brand around yourself and making yourself look like the most important part of that thing that you just built, right? 
I mean, I think founders are coming into a point where the really good founders will have their pick of who they want as investors. So investors now have to do a really good job of saying, how are you going to be differentiated as capital? It's not just, you know, everybody's money is not the same. So make sure you know who you're picking. I think this Hollywoodization of founders with Netflix, we crashed and super pumped and drop out. Our industry has kind of been mocked in a way, but it's also highlighting the thing of, yes, you need a charismatic leader to lead a company, but don't get swept up in... Again, it's hype. If you're an investor and you're following the masses, you're doing it wrong, right? You got to zig when everybody's zagging and you have to feel comfortable being in non-consensus. And that is really hard to do. And people don't realize that our our industries become kind of short-term thinkers in a long-term game. So you've got to really be able to stomach that. My dad used to always say, you make your money when you buy, right? Yeah. <laughs> What's the market like right now? It seems like it was white hot just a few months ago for talent. I know firsthand that's something that at Human, you guys are really often helping your portfolio companies find and secure really talented people. And it was a really, really tight market. It feels like things are about to change a little bit. I think the Dara email to Uber employees about really focused more on getting closer to profitability rather than growth at any cost. We're seeing Coinbase pulling back on hiring. I think we're going to see a lot more of this. And I'm just curious, are we going from a market where you could just name your price if you were an engineer to now maybe we're going to have a glut? I still think really good talent is hard to find. I think having a very strong hiring culture and understanding where the business is going is going to be more and more important to be able to attract those really talented people. So I think it's more important than ever to have a strong stance as a leader, knowing where your organization's going, having the right benefits and incentives are all going to be there. Gen Z, people talk about Gen Z not being as serious about work. And I came into my career in the financial crisis. We were told we could do anything. You really had to figure out what were you good at? What skills were you offering? How did you get a job? What were you adding value? And I think that's always really important and shouldn't be overlooked. All right. So you just mentioned Gen Z and some of the thoughts about them and work and that sort of thing. So I'm just curious because there's been a lot of talk about this. And when you think about how a lot of Gen Z workers have been able to operate probably at a high productivity level during the pandemic, obviously enabled by technology. I'm curious how you think of that as a mega trend within tech. What does hybrid work? What does work look like going forward? And are some of the things that we've all adopted over the last couple years are they here to stay in your opinion? One thing's for sure is that the future of work looks very different than it did two years ago, three years ago, but definitely as we know it in our generations of saying work is going to the office in nine to five. It doesn't mean that the work ethic isn't going to be there. One of our categories of thesis is future of work. And how we look at that is there's more opportunity now than ever to upskill, to reskill, to figure out the fit of what you're really good at and how you want to learn. And so I'm more interested in what are the things that keep you excited about work and keep you learning at work and the curiosity because no longer is it punching in and out. That's not going to be a thing. You have to make sure that you're adding value to that team. Or, But how do you create culture like that? I mean that sincerely. I mean, it's really hard. You just gave the example in the start of the pandemic, the way that you would start your daily all hands meetings and you weren't going to talk about work. And I'm sure that really helped people get to know each other and everything like that. But sooner or later, everyone's got to be interacting and mentors have to be able to do their thing and people have to see other people, how they operate in different situations. And it's really hard to do that over Zoom. Oh, it is. I will always have a bias towards in-person. I love in-person. We brought on Esther Perel, who's a world-renowned relationship psychologist. And you know, she's like, people don't do business with business. You do business with people. And you actually want to do better work for people you care about and you understand and you know. So one company we invested in is a company called Murmur. They are a shared agreements platform. They codify decision-making processes, and they're able to scale decision-making faster for companies. And whether you're hybrid or you're in the office or whatever, you're actually creating technology that helps really put some of those things in process that people just leave to the wayside and say, oh, it's going to happen. I think you'll start to see technology-enabled solutions that help with that. I think you'll also start to see policies and benefits that bring into account more about the person as a whole. Do they have a family? How do they work? Do they work better in the morning, at night? And having a little bit more flexibility around that if the productivity is there. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about philanthropy as a service because I got to bring up Jake Wood here. 
Talk to me about Groundswell because I've gotten to know Jake, CEO, founder of that company. And I think this actually really fits into the thesis that you're talking about here as far as providing services for a workplace that is changing really because the worker is changing and their mindset is changing. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say he's it's an example of everything altogether. He was an ex-Marine. He was a nonprofit leader for 10 years. He's phenomenal leader, can sell a vision, can fundraise, build a culture. And Tech didn't know who he was. So we found Jake. We knew he wanted to build with Jake. It was first check into his company. And he's one of the fastest growing founders we have. And it proves that thesis that there are other builders and other industries that are coming into the startup environment. And that's going to be amazing for it. So Groundswell is really, it's a benefits platform to be able to democratize the donor advice fund. So all rich people, they have their foundations, their DAFs. They can hold that tax exempt and then donate when they need to. Jake said, why can't the employee have access to that? And it's kind of coming at this really beautiful time of social finance, too, where you're showing people where you invest and how you invest and what your thought process is around that. Well, donating is definitely investing as well. It's investing in where you feel like you want to have an impact and what your identity is. So I think it's a really interesting social platform for companies to be able to encourage their employees to understand what they care about and take action around it. So health and wellness, philanthropy as a service. Let's talk about, you mentioned this before, that your dad's advice is what value are you going to add as an entrepreneur, as an investor? And I think one of the ones, and I've gotten to know these guys, and they are a sponsor of OK Computer, is Current. And you guys were an early investor in Current, and Stuart and Trevor, the two co-founders, they've been on the pod before. And I've heard the story a little bit, but I'm just really curious from your standpoint, what was the thing that attracted you and Joe to what they were doing? They don't like to call themselves a bank. They're a challenge bank or a neobank, but really it's a fintech platform. They're trying to bridge gaps between a certain part, at least here in the U.S. or North America, of the socioeconomic stratum that are basically not well-banked. And they're not serviced in a way because maybe a lot of the big financial institutions don't see the ability to make money on them. They see something that the big banks don't see. You guys saw something in them and their platform. I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about that. Stuart and Trevor, they're two of those people who I was talking about that they saw the world 10 years out and they were frustrated, you know, the, the moment that they started. They're still frustrated. Yeah. but they, And that's what you love. You're frustrated that the world isn't caught up to where you are yet. And so you just want to jump on that train. I think the other thing to think about right now is in this environment, it's much better to be a small ship than the Titanic, right? So they're not a small ship anymore. They're growing like a rocket ship, but they have the ability right now, I think, to get ahead of banks where they really are banking for a different population, a younger generation. And then they're able to have a lot of insights they can see with all of that as well. So I'm very bullish on them. What's next for human? When you think about this, you guys just moved into these beautiful offices in downtown Manhattan. I'm in there a lot, and I see other founders in there. I see other investors in there. I see other interesting people, Esther Perel, like you just mentioned. What's next for human here? Because it feels like you guys are like really hitting your stride. I know that you launched that fund. We had a pandemic. You guys built a lot of great things or helped build a lot of great things in that period of time. Where are you guys going next? Yeah, if you're somebody who wants to be in this asset class, now is the time to invest in the managers who know the right founders, who have the right networks. And so we're really poised, I think, to do even more of the same. Build from scratch, early investors, find the founders that nobody else knows yet, back them until the world sees them, understand where those human trends are going and get out there in front of it, and then continue to back them as they scale. What do you think about capital continuing to come in this space? I know there's a lot of bad headlines right now. You saw that SoftBank one where the combination of their portfolios in Q1 was down $26 billion. And we know that they were driving a lot of the valuation insanity that was going on over the last five years. So I'm just curious, when you talk to LPs, what do you say? Now's the time? Now's the time for, I think, emerging leaders, the fastest growing emerging funds. You want to be able to understand where people have differentiated networks and they understand how to evaluate founders that are different because you want to be looking for those undiscovered and underinvested areas right now. By definition, the arbitrage opportunity is where other people aren't. So don't go where there's the large, huge funds who are deploying billions of dollars. You know, in 2021, $331 billion went into venture. But if you take out all the $100 million mega deal, 
deals by the four or five big mega funds. $140 billion were deployed. And most of that value that's being created under the smaller deals, they're emerging managers. The next injuries in Horowitz are being built right now. The next first round capitals. And so you have to look at where there are new views in the market and take a shot. We call it visionary sources of capital right now. So LPs by nature are 10 years in the past. They're going to always be in the blue chip companies, but you're starting to see a lot more of them carve out these pools of capital for what they call emerging leaders, funds two, three, four of people who have differentiated networks and they're looking at things differently because venture's not going away. Innovation's not going away. The capital that's going to be in growth, this is a way that people are starting businesses and creating value. Find the people who know how to pick the people and then have the platform and operations and network to be able to support those to win because then kind of a rig game from there. You make a great point. It's kind of like a mega trend here. So if you have access to venture, I mean, think about it as it relates to public markets right now, there's five companies and you know what they are. They make up 40% of the weight of the NASDAQ 100. So there's not a lot of alpha to be had there. And then we just saw this tremendous period of exits, whether it be through regular way, IPO, direct, SPAC. And there was some good M&A over the last few years and some amazing valuations. Again, if you were market timing, that worked out really well. But if you didn't, it really is kind Come full circle, if you will. So how do you invest in the future of tech? How do you invest in the future of innovation? And I think access to people like yourselves who can find those trends, that makes a lot of sense to me. And to validate all of that is the explosion in crossover funds, right? Over the last, let's call it 10 years or so. So funds who want to invest also in growth rounds and private. So to me, it all makes sense. Venture's not going away. I love your human thesis. You guys, you and Joe are great humans. Your whole team are great humans. You guys have been a tremendous help to me. I will say this. We didn't even get to this yet, but one of my favorite human portfolio companies is obviously the maker of Comos Tequila. Oh. And you know that we send every guest a bottle of Comos. Do I have to send a bottle to you? No, I don't. I think I, think I know where they live. Okay, all right, you know where they live. But listen, Heather Hartnett, I really appreciate you coming on Go Key Computer. I appreciate all the support and your friendship. So thank you, and I hope you come back. Thank you. It was a pleasure. All right, thanks.